there's one thing that I think you you sort of touch on here, which is, and it might be useful for, well, you're talking here about kind of like the extent to which football was popular among white South Africans. I think a lot of people don't know that. And maybe, so if you could do maybe two things just at the outset, for people who don't know South African football, can you just give like the broad outlines of South African football, almost like a kind of a highlight reel um, and I'm sort of giving you an impossible task here at the beginning to tell the history <laughs> of more than 120, I think it's way more than that, of like football mm -hmm. history in like a few minutes. So kind mm -hmm. of just like the, the main highlights. And I think this key point is really to, to the, 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 there was like a white South African football union. I think that's the, is that the earliest stab national football union in South Africa, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Well, very, very quickly, um, I think we need to look at when football was codified. In other words, when the rules of football were agreed on. So football as soccer, as we know today, association football, which of course is where the term soccer originates from. Those rules are written in 1863. Rugby union, the rugby that's played in South Africa, those rules were written in 1871. But in South Africa, we have some of the earliest references to football. Now, these are games of rugby and soccer that are combined, that the rules have haven't necessarily been agreed yet. We have these from the early uh, 1860s. But in terms of football clubs being established, we have football clubs, being soccer clubs being established in Cape Town, in, uh, in Durban in the 1880s. And indeed, you're correct, the uh, South African Football Association is established in, uh, in 1892. It's one of the first football associations outside of the uh, British Isles. And if you look at, at FIFA's um, oldest members, in many, in many instances, this football association is older than these uh, the, these members themselves. South Africa, actually, this white football, importantly, it's a whites only football association. They actually joined FIFA in uh, 1910. And by this stage, they'd had a long uh, relationship with the English FA uh, in London, of course. They were, um, they were honorary members. So there's this long entanglement with South African uh, football with and English football. But of course, these clubs that are emerging in the 1880s, and this is, I think we can tie it into the Super the, the, the super League discussion. The first thing you want to do is when you establish a team is you want to play against another team, obviously. And in many ways, some of the first uh, tours to and from South Africa um, are, of course, rugby and cricket, but also football. So you have, for example, in 1897, you have the Corinthians Football Club, which of course is an amateur football club based in London. They actually tour uh, outside of Europe for the first time when they visit South Africa. They visit on a three-month uh, trip and they play all across the country. They only play against white opposition, but we do have black spectators who are watching this. And um, they would classify this as these missionaries of empire. In other words, they're taking the, the game of football to, to the colonies. But the argument um, I've made in some recent publications around the Corinthians is that they did this because there was good money to be made from these football tours. And these football tours generated significant profits for the tourists themselves, but of course also for the local um, associations because these local associations were charging uh, entrance fees uh, for uh, uh, for spectators and interesting and importantly differential prices on the basis of race that meant if you were a black spectator you got to sit in the the worst seats right in the sun but you also paid the lowest price so uh football tours are absolutely crucial and um this continues all through the uh, through the 20th century uh england and or britain and south african football is 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 entwined if we look at some of the um, South African players, and initially these were white players, before World War uh, II, the Second World War, um, the majority of foreign players in British football outside of the British Isles and Ireland were South Africans. So we have dozens and dozens of South Africans playing in British uh, uh, league football. And uh, this is a concern for the local association in, in South Africa because their best talent is going abroad. And then in the 1930s is when the first sort of black black football clubs are being formed and black black in terms of South African football, that's when that's when you see like the emergence of sort of black organized football, let's say like at a national level, or does the national level for blacks come a little later? I mean, we're talking in terms no, of segregated football. I would actually I'd actually argue that it's much earlier. I think uh, uh, authors have argued that it was the sort of the 19, 1950, 1916, but we have evidence from uh, the 1880s and the 1890s that black South Africans are playing 
uh, organized football. And the example that I use is, of course, the the famous 1899 tour of a group of 15 black South Africans uh, from essentially from Bloemfontein who go to Britain just before the outbreak of the South African War and play um, roughly 50, just under 50 games across uh, across Britain uh, and um, are pitted against the elite clubs of the day. And they lose basically every single match. Uh, they're laughed at and they're ridiculed, um, but they're pioneers. They're absolutely football pioneers. And this is unfortunately has just been ignored in South African sporting history has been incorrectly referenced the year, for example. And these were groundbreakers. They were absolutely, if we talk about a globalization of football, South African footballs and black South African footballs were at the forefront of this uh, this, this proto-globalization in an era of, uh, of of colonialism, of course. Why was that, by the way? I mean, I'm, I've, I've, I mean, I was reading your paper and I was struck by this because it's not only this tour of black footballers in 1899, but shortly after that, a South African team travels all the way to South America. They go to mm -hmm. Argentina. So in the early 20th century, how did it end up that South Africa, of all places, led the early globalization of football? What was it about the nature of South Africa and the country it was becoming at the time that meant that it was well-placed to, to lead this effort of making football international? Well, I think, uh, as, I, as I've said, because of the organized nature of um, South African football through its various associations, through its national association, they had close contact with the English Football Association, which meant that they could organize tours to and from each country. So uh, the, you have these Corinthian football tours coming to, to, to South Africa. You also have English FA representative teams. Now, this is the, the amateur team or the second team, if you like. They come as early as 1910 to South Africa. Um, this tour um, to to, to uh, South America in 1906 coincides with the tour of the Rugby Springboks to, to Britain at the same time. And the Rugby Springboks basically win all their matches in, 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 in Britain on this tour. But so do the South Africans in South America. They lose one game in Argentina, but they basically win all the games. They beat a Brazilian uh, uh, 11, and some Brazilian authors suggest that this is the first Brazil 11, if you like. I mean, there are questions around that. But I think what is happening here, which is often overlooked in South African sport and soccer history in particular, is that there's a class dynamic emerging here. Right. In other words, in um, South African schools, now I'm not talking only about white schools, I'm also talking about the mission schools, uh, Zonablom, Lovedale, Health Town, St. Matthews, etc. Soccer is frowned upon because many of these teachers are coming from elite schools or elite training backgrounds in uh, Britain where rugby is the, pre the, the preferred sport. And that's why a, a school such as uh, Bishops in, in, in Cape Town is where you have the emergence of rugby and, and rugby being such a uh, uh, or Cape Town is such a hot hotbed for uh, rugby in uh, South Africa is because of the schooling systems. Uh, and here we have these uh, successful rugby players representing a certain class of a new white South African. And that is then pushed as opposed to this more working class or uh, lower middle class white South African who's just as successful as, uh, as their rugby counterparts. And this is this idea of this an invention of a tradition, this inventing a tradition that South African, white South Africans are made for this frontier, this, this rugged game called rugby as opposed to, as opposed to soccer or, 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 or the beautiful game as such. Um, just be, before we move on, I kind of wanted to, you mentioned like there's a team called Corinthians. Um, mm -hmm. it's, touring, it's touring South Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you could, like, who is this team? Because I, I've seen this name a couple of times and I'm also kind of curious, like, like, who is this team? I know after them, some Scottish teams come to South Africa in the early part mm -hmm. of the 20th century, Aberdeen, I think mm -hmm. Motherwell. And then That's just correct. a whole bunch of teams start coming to South Africa kind of regularly, right? Almost every three mm -hmm. to four years and just mm -hmm. tour there. And the, um, mm. we, this is just the early part. We're not even talking after the Second World War, but just for like that mm. early part of the story. Mm. Well, the Corinthians were this amateur team, a scratch team. In other words, it was like a, a, a pickup game, a pickup club of some of the best English footballers in southern in southern England. And the reason, the, the reasoning behind the establishment of the Corinthians, and they were established in 1882, the same year as the establishment of the Natal Football Association. So we can see that the 
the, the dates are quite similar. The Corinthians are established as a team to challenge Scottish football. In other words, the Scots are the, are the, are the leaders in, in, in British football. And the Corinthians are established as this, importantly, this amateur team. And these players all come from elite British institutions, obviously uh, Oxford and, uh, and and Cambridge, and their idea is they have this missionary zeal. They wear a white a white shirt. Real Madrid's white shirt comes from uh, uh, the original Corinthians. Corinthians in Sao Paulo is a direct consequence of the Corinthians visiting Brazil in 1910. There are a number of examples of teams called Corinthians all over South Africa during this period. But their their ideas, they're this amateur gentleman. In other words, they would refuse to uh, take penalties if penalties were awarded to them because their argument was that a gentleman doesn't foul another gentleman. And this really annoyed the South Africans. This really annoyed the South Africans because the South African referees were blowing these fouls and the uh, Corinthians refused to take these penalties. And they were saying, you're undermining us as, uh, as, as officials. You're, you're, you're bringing these values which are no longer necessarily part of the modern game. And this is the, the early uh, uh, 20th century. So the Corinthians lead the way. But importantly, the Corinthians, their first tour, they win all the games, all their games in 1897. By their final tour to South Africa in 1907, they lose half the games. So they're not necessarily that good anymore. That means uh, the local association cannot... Uh, ask as much money for these uh, uh, teams because they're not very good. So guess what? The Corinthians start going to new markets. They start visiting Canada. They start visiting visiting the United States. They visit Brazil on a number of occasions. They go to new football markets to generate uh, income. So this, so these Corinthians, I think, were, were were groundbreakers, but they weren't necessarily these amateur gentlemen that they made out to be. You referenced the 1920s and 1930s. You're correct, Sean. Um, Aberdeen and um, Motherwell are the first professional sides to visit South Africa before uh, the, the, the Second World War. And what is absolutely central and crucial for the development of black football is that many, well, a number of black South African teams are modeled on uh, Motherwell. And we have teams called, named after Motherwell. And the reason being, is uh, they are these scientific exponents, these new uh, exponents of a new form of football. And uh, South African state start to play this kind of game and start to use these names um, to uh, establish their own sides across across South Africa. So these two, these initial tours are absolutely crucial in solidifying these relations between um, Britain and South African football, British and South African football. To talk about that relationship between British and South African football, what I was fascinated to discover was, especially in that early 20th century period, the extent to which South African football and its official associations were so attached to, to empire. So thinking back to what you've just spoken about now, about the missionary zeal within, within which some of those early tours happened, how it was just so connected to this project of empire, uh, so the South African Football Association doesn't really want to affiliate to FIFA. It prefers the English FA at some stage. Mm -hmm. It even proposes a British Commonwealth Association. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you wrote in your essay, That's South's kind of global engagement. Yeah, exactly. Their own Super League of just, of just the colonies and dominions at that time where everyone would blissfully never take pen penalties and engage in this mm -hmm. gentleman's game. So, I mean... How did it end up being so attached to, I mean, obviously we know why, but I mean, why, especially football, was it important to maintain the, the vision of empire at that period? Well, you, I think we must go back to, to immigration to South Africa. Remember the, the European immigration at the end of the 19th century, uh, of course, primarily from Britain and many uh, many working class men coming over uh, to South Africa with a, a football knowledge and a football history that they that was exploding in Britain during this during this time. And if you look at some of the the first uh, football clubs in, in in Cape Town, for example, Park Villa. Park Villa is 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 named after Aston Villa because one of the fir the founders of Aston Villa landed up in uh, Cape Town as a gunmaker. So you have these affinities and these connections from a very early period. South Africa, of course, of all the colonies during this period, so we think of Canada, we think of New Zealand, we think of Australia, their soccer team was by far the strongest of 
these uh, 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 these colonies. And what the South African uh, Football Association was very keen on trying to establish in the 1930s was what they called a British Empire Football Association. So that would be the British uh, uh, Britain playing against these uh, colonies. I don't think the South Africans necessarily considered that the uh, that the empire would no longer be white very, very soon and that they'd have to play against uh, uh, black players. But they were at the forefront of driving this because Britain or the English FA weren't keen to join uh, FIFA in, 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 its, in its founding years and, of course, didn't play in the first two, first three World Cups uh, because of their disdain for the continent, uh, the continent, this disdain for the for, for European football organizers. Who are these French and Swiss um, uh, football officials taking our game away from us? So I think the South Africans fitted in uh, to the English FA because, of course, many of them were British themselves and, and were probably uh, first generation um, white South Africans were from, from British heritage. So there's this affinity to, to England from a very early stage.